Today we are going to be talking about the Stats tab in Feet, which allows you to set up a model that you can then use at each voxel in your data set. And we'll also be covering how your timing files should be set up so that they can be read into Feet. First, we're going to be covering these first three options here. Again, usually the defaults are fine. Uh, film pre-whitening, you should leave that on. What it will do is it will try to account for any sort of autocorrelation present in your signal. Uh, these next two uh, try to account for any confound or nuisance parameters, such as motion. So, for example, if you have a subject that moved a lot, which might be common in patient populations or child populations, you might want to do that to soak up any variance associated with head motion. And, again, if you have a text file which might have timing information for any conditions of non-interest or nuisance variables, you can add that in here. Um, I'm going to leave those unchecked for now because the subject that we scanned in this experiment was a pretty good subject and didn't move too much. So what you're going to be wanting to focus on is the full model setup. The model setup wizard is if you have very simple block design which you can uh, set up rather easily and replicate across your studies. Now for any event related design which is more common you want to use full model setup. So let's go ahead and click on that, and you see two tabs here, EVs, which stand for explanatory variables, just think of those as regressors, and then the contrasts and F-tests that we can set up after we've specified our EVs. In this experiment, we only had four regressors. Okay, and whoops, four, right. Okay, so what we need to do is specify a name for the regressor what kind of shape that we predict it would have, and what we want to convolve it with. Now for this, usually it is best to select custom three column format. This allows you the most flexibility in specifying when your condition occurred, for how long it occurred, and any other sort of auxiliary behavioral information. So we're going to go ahead and select that. Now. I'm going to show you really quick what a typical timing file should look like if you're going to be using the custom three column format. In this data set that is available for download on the website, I give you eight different text files uh, because there are four conditions and two runs. So four conditions per run, two runs, eight text files. If I just take a look in one of these, such as FSL tap left underscore one, the one stands for the first run. There are three columns here. The first column refers to when the start of the condition happened in seconds relative to the beginning of the run. So, in other words, right when the scanner started, 46 seconds, well, 46.569, repeating of course, seconds into the run was the first occurrence of this tap left condition. So, I had four conditions. One of them I just tapped my left finger, other one I just tapped my right finger, and there were also other conditions where I held my breath and then I exhaled and breathed normally. The second column here specifies for how long was this condition present for. So in this case, this is tap left, I tapped my left finger for 15 seconds. There were instructions on the screen that said tap left, and I did that for 15 seconds. All right. Lastly, this third column will allow you to specify any sort of parametric modulation information. So if there are any features about the condition or the stimulus that may have some parametric information that you think might be uh, modulating the height of the bold signal, you can put that in there. For example, maybe you have uh, luminance as some sort of parametric modulation that you think might be affecting your bold signal. For most purposes, if you have no reason to believe that there's any sort of parametric modulation within your conditions, you can just set this as 1. All right. So I'm going to go ahead here, and this first EV is going to be called tab left. And for the file name, all right, go into FSL underscore onsets and FSL underscore tab left underscore 1. Okay, and we're going to be convolving it with a gamma. So, in other words, this is what a gamma function looks like. 
The reason it's so widespread in use in fMRI experiments is because using the parameters of a gamma function, you can use it to approximate a so-called canonical hemodynamic response very well, which is why we use it so often. Again, it's not as though that assumption holds in all cases or all parts of the brain, but by and large, it's a very safe bet to just use that to convolve with all of your stimuli. Okay, uh, the rest of these are fine. Don't worry about them. Uh, orthogonalized, do not do this unless you have a very good reason to believe that you know that all of the variants should be placed onto this variable as opposed to uh, any of the other variables. Uh, essentially what this does is it will force the GLM, or your general linear model, to assign uh, equal amounts of variance among your regressors. Okay, And you can orthogonalize it with respect to other variables. Uh, usually don't do that because, again, <laughs> it's it can introduce a lot of biases, and usually we don't know exactly uh, how orthogonal the regressor should be. This should be taken care of in your experimental design rather than forced after the fact. So add temporal derivative and apply temporal filtering. Those are both fine. A temporal derivative will attempt to account for any shifts or lags in the onset of the bold response. And applying temporal filtering, again, will apply that high-pass filter we specified previously in the last tutorial. Excuse me. So we've only entered in one EV, but I'm going to go ahead and view the design right now. Okay. So just focus on these first two. Uh, these last aren't going to mean anything because we haven't filled in anything yet. But for tap left, you can see that at each of the times where the tap left condition was on, you see this whiter, uh, brighter shading here. Okay. And it lasts for 15 seconds and some time elapsed, and then it was on again for 15 seconds, some time elapsed, and it's been convolved with the canonical gamma HRF right here. So just looking at your timing files, this pattern should make sense. I know that they were equally spaced out and that they lasted for 15 seconds. Now this second column here, you might notice that down here it says tap left underneath both of these columns. The second column will attempt to account for any sort of temporal derivative. All right. So in other words, if I go back and I don't apply a temporal derivative, I will essentially only have one column for the tap left condition. Okay. Uh, lastly, this red line over here, this represents the uh, size of your high pass filter. So this represents an interval of 100 seconds. Now, if any of these whiter shaded regions were greater than the length of this, then that means that they lasted greater than 100 seconds, and therefore they might be filtered out by the high-pass filter. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and do the exact same thing for the other regressors. So I'll just follow along, and it should just be a few seconds. Again, I'm going into FSL onsets. I'm selecting each condition with the underscore one in front of it because we're dealing with run one. Okay, that's all good. Breathe. And hold. Okay. All right, not too bad, right? Okay, so after we have all those done, click on View Design, and whoops, let me go back and apply the temporal derivative. Okay, so we have eight columns here because there are four conditions and each one has also a temporal derivative applied to it, which also needs to be estimated. So, again, this design is just for you to look at, make sure it looks fine, make sure it looks reasonable, and I know from the timing files and from the experimental paradigm that this looks like what it should look like. All right, lastly, you can click on this efficiency tab over here, and this first square over here, 
This represents any correlation between your different regressors. Okay. Notice that these diagonals, they should all be white because these represent each of the conditions correlated with itself, which will be one. Uh, so notice that this first one, you know, the first regressor I put in was tap left, and then it's temporal derivative, tap right, temporal derivative, and so on. Now, if any of these off-diagonal boxes are very bright or white, we would have a problem because two of our regressors would be very highly correlated. Now, this isn't too bad, so it looks okay. And this other box over here represents the efficiency in estimating each of these regressors. Now, if any of these boxes on the diagonal are very, very dark or black, that means that you might have an issue. And lastly, when we start setting up our contrast, it'll tell you what kind of effect is required in terms of percent signal change to obtain an effect which will pass your threshold that you specify, which we will also talk about later. All right, so that's all been set up and it looks good. So we're gonna go ahead to contrast and F tests. This will uh, take the beta weights which are estimated for each of your conditions and allow you to either calculate simple effects or contrasts, or even F-tests if you want to do that. So here I am going to calculate a contrast, and I'll show you why in a little second. This first contrast I'm going to say is going to be, uh, let's say, at left minus right. That's going to be the tap left minus tap right. Now, you should write this down on a sheet of paper just so you don't get too confused, but just make sure you know what each EV is associated with each regressor. So if I go back here, I know that EV1 is tap left, EV2 is tap right, and so on. So if I want a contrast of the tap left minus tap right, then I would want to assign a beta weight of 1 for tap left, just a weight, not, not necessarily a beta weight, a weight of 1 for left, and a weight of negative 1 for right and these other ones can be left at zero. Uh, so same thing, I might want to look at the opposite contrast just to have all my bases covered and I would assign the opposite weights. Now let's see here with breathe minus hold breath, I'll double check, breathe was three, hold breath was four. So breathe minus hold breath is going to be one in the EV3 column and negative one in the EV4 column. And same thing over here. Now this is also good practice just to calculate a uh, beta weight for each of your conditions alone because contrasts, while they're useful, you can also lose some information once you start subtracting beta weights from each other. So I'm going to just calculate a beta weight for left, just assign a weight of 1 for EV1. Uh, same thing for right, and you get the picture. Okay, and I'm not going to be calculating them now, but say if you want to calculate some sort of F-test, uh, which can calculate whether there's an effect of multiple contrasts simultaneously, you can go ahead and do that. So if, for example, I wanted to see whether there was an effect of any one of my regressors, I could select um, an, an F value for, or just select this F1 box for each of my regressors. Okay, I'm not going to do that right now, but you can. All right. So after you've done that, hit done. And, whoops, I should not have an F test. Click done. And again, it'll automatically pop the model for you to review. Uh, so I'm going to make sure that looks good. And then you're done setting up your model with the stats tab. Okay. So that really isn't too bad, and now we're going to go ahead and finish up the rest of the tutorial with the post stats and registration before we run feet.